and welcome to the Psych Tech Podcast. This is episode two. I am Kelly. And I'm Josue. And today we're going to talk about what, Josue? Last week we talked about perception from a point of view uh, where people are doing things and, and trying to create a certain impression. And uh, this week something really, really cool happened in the tech world where Microsoft had a press conference and they showed off a way to augment reality or another way, you know, perception. And I think we can't not talk about it. Like, I'm just so excited to talk about everything that happened there and kind of what it means for us and what it could mean in the future. And, you know, some other other kind of related things like it's this is not the first time augmented reality has been you know, introduced. It has also been a part of our science fiction for a really long time. And there's already uh, a backlash against it. So there's a, there's a lot of social context going around as well. So that's what we're going to be diving into today. So why don't we just go ahead and start off with uh, what was most exciting to you about the event that happened uh, earlier this week? So um, really what, what Microsoft presented was the idea of Microsoft holographic, the idea that they were going to introduce a, a self-contained computer uh, on your head that would create what they're calling holograms, just like 3D objects in a virtual space that are projected onto reality, like your actual space. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I mean, I think the idea of the idea of holograms is not something I think most people are probably familiar with it. I mean, they they, they what they didn't wasn't during the Super Bowl. They beamed in. No, it was a concert. They beamed in the you know, deceased form of a, uh, one of the singers, I can't remember. Was it Biggie Smalls? No. It's been two, Tupac, Tupac and Tupac. Michael Jackson holograms have yeah. performed on stage. Yes. And I yes. know uh, last election they had like the reporter holographically being brought in to the newsroom and things like that. And I always thought that was really funny because they have a 3D hologram on a 2D projection because your TV or my TV at least only does 2D. So I thought that was a clever waste of resources. But yeah, it, the holograms are here, and they're they're a thing. And I think Microsoft is maybe the first to really try and push it out as a as a commercial product and for for everybody. Yeah, and and it's good that you brought up those uh, musicians because if you see if you see that Michael Jackson one in particular, um, which was uh, you can look it up online, and we should probably put a link to that performance. It looks incredible because there's actual dancers, there's things happening on stage, and Michael Jackson is there and he's dancing, and you cannot tell. I mean, you know that it's not him, but you can't tell what's being projected on the stage and what isn't. And it's a lot of light trickery and uh, stuff, but it looked so real on video. I don't know what it looked like there because I, I, I wasn't there, but it looked it looked incredible. Kind of that idea of, of projecting something that everybody can see is not what Microsoft is doing it, at all. In any way, like they're not going to they're not proposing that we have projectors at your house that kind of project things in your space. No, they did that a couple of years ago. They called it the Illuma room. Mm -hmm. And yep. basically you'd have your TV and then the environment of wherever you were would be kind of around your walls. But they decided it really wasn't feasible because you would have to basically install a projector in your ceiling. And they figured people either are too lazy or not quite smart enough to do that. I probably fall into both categories. So, but it was a really cool idea and I'm I'm kind of excited to see these uh hollow lenses. I call them hoggles. I think that's really cool. And <laughs> I just <Nah. laughs> call it hoggles. It's it's going to catch on and I expect royalties when it does. We'll 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 see. I'll I'll take a bet okay. on hoggles. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh so maybe people, I mean, I think a lot of people even if you see the video of what they showed, it's kind of hard to process. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wanted to break it down. There's a big difference. We're not talking about virtual reality. That's something that I definitely, we should talk about in a little bit. But uh, really what they're doing is, is augmented reality, which is the idea of introducing something to your current space. And there's a really simple example of what that looks like. Um, if if anybody has a, a Yelp app, you know, the, the restaurant review website. I do. Um, so if you go onto your phone, there's a feature there called the monocle. Have you ever used this? No, I didn't even know it existed. Okay. So you go into your Yelp app and you do a regular search like you would. Okay. I want to find breakfast right around my, my house or in a new city. You go in, 
you activate the monocle and then you put up the camera. And with the screen facing you, the camera facing the other way, as you're panning the camera around, you see the city, but you see the Yelp reviews and tags floating in the air in the direction that the restaurant is located. And if you're right at the location, it'll show up above um, like the entrance. Okay. Okay, yeah, I so, gotcha. And that's a very simple um, example of augmented reality. What you're looking at through the camera is exactly what's behind the phone, right? Mm -hmm. But through this magic lens, which is your phone, uh, you can see all this other information overlaid on top of it. And it has all that information. The, the hologram part that uh, Microsoft is discussing is that they're taking space into consideration. So in the case of the Yelp app, it's actually taking direction and position into consideration. So it knows that, you know, due east is there's three different restaurants. And once you arrive at one restaurant, you should be able to pan over and see them one next to each other with this uh, like pop up bubble right above them when you see it through your phone. So it's more like an overlay of additional information rather than the generation of an entirely different world. Yes. And it's very similar, right? Video games are very popular. A lot of people play uh, and have a heads up display or a HUD. Yes. And it's information that's on your, your screen overlaid on top of the things that you're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. um, or maybe even like if you're watching Sports Center or you're watching the news, there's all these the tickers and all this other information floating on, around like that. But imagine that being projected real time. Kind of uh, Google Glass was supposed to do that. Um, that's the way it works. There's information popping up on your. Uh, in your field of vision, sort of, right? It doesn't block anything. It doesn't create anything new. It's just you have this information kind of there to complement what's going on in the real world. Well, I think it's interesting you bring up Google Glass because this announcement came on the tail end of Google Glass kind of getting shut down. It's not so much, I don't think it's so much shut down as uh, kind of like scaling back. Yeah. Right? I think they were really, really pushing it forward. I think it was $5,000 to buy, uh, to get a... Um, one of the first to be one of the first people to have a pair and now they were like oh we need to kind of step back i don't think it's going anywhere but i don't think it's anywhere near um that commercial viability that they they had originally proposed yeah a friend of mine has one and he was uh, the google glass and was wearing it around and i know his biggest complaint was the battery just could not support it for like any length of time but obviously that's 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 a wearable. That's something that is intended to be worn out into the world like your regular glasses, whereas this particular uh, hollow lens, to use the proper term, I feel or like hoggle. It's, or hoggle or hoggle uh, is more like your Xbox or your PlayStation. Like it stays at home and it is meant to be used in that in a, one specific, specific area, not necessarily just worn around like campus or outside. Not necessarily. Because it's supposed to be self-contained. It's supposed to work independent of a computer. I guess. Yeah. I'm just trying to think about how I would personally react and how other people would react if you were, like, walking down the street and somebody had this giant, like, bug-eyed visor over their eyes. Uh, I, I'm i sure in the, f in the future it, it will be less... Uh, less odd to see, but for right now, I know if I was, I would definitely take a second, second look, especially if they were like crossing the street or something that you normally want to see that person's eyes. And yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think I'm cool enough to try and pull that off in public yet. Although I guess maybe Daft Punk have already done it, so maybe it is cool. Yeah, they should. They should make full, full blown hollow helmets yeah. instead of just hollow lenses. Yeah, so you, yeah, you yeah. Like Daft Punk. Yeah, yeah. I like it. That's when, the future. When you drive your motorcycle, you can be paying attention to different things. That's the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but you're absolutely right that um, the way they presented it, and, and I want to go over kind of the examples that they gave to kind of really understand what it is that they're proposing and what, uh, the possible uses that there could be for this. But you could actually, the idea is that it's self-contained. So you could take it with you and... Um, sure, maybe you won't wear it on the street, but you could put it in a briefcase and take it to your job and then use it at home and then use it at school, things like that. So uh, a few of the examples that they that they provided, uh, let me see, the, the coolest one, I think, is uh, using Skype. So mm -hmm. really simple. I mean, we're, we're using Skype right now, right? Yeah. And so imagine a hol holographic Skype. Um, what they did was they had all the reporters go into a room that was kind of dark and there was where the light switch was supposed to be there was just a hole in the wall and some cables hanging so then they have the hollow lens on and they get a call from a technician they see the technician like on a screen floating in the air 
in in their hololens and then the technician switches their view so that they can see what you're looking at through a camera and then on their screen they're drawing on top of uh, the light switch and the cables and they're providing you visual directions by drawing on their screen and you're seeing it in a 3d space and the important thing is that it's not just like if it was a canvas and they're drawing on top of it so they draw three arrows and then you move your head and the arrows are moving everywhere the way the whole holographic idea is that if they point at a specific uh, cable or they circle it when your head moves that drawing doesn't move it stays in a 3d position so it becomes like an object in the air make sense that's the sound of my brain exploding yeah yeah yeah, yeah, in, a, yeah. in a good way like <laughs> in a really really good way because i can just imagine like next level youtube tutorials when i'm asking youtube you know how do i install a nest in my home and i can just put on my hoggles and have somebody walk me through in three dimensions how to install that particular piece of of tech that's really exciting although i think i think we know what the the hololens is really going to be used for what is that porn yeah oh yeah 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 i mean uh, the success of any new technology <laughs> lies entirely on the pornography industry that is absolutely true that actually was the most feedback i saw was people excited <laughs> about the the potential porn possibilities of having I just, I don't even want to think about it too much. Can you, that, okay, that, I'm going to say, that could, that does weird me out a little bit. The idea that I could be in an office space and a coworker could be right next to me with his hoggles on or her hoggles on and watching porn. So I didn't expect this to go in this direction, but, <laughs> right, the way that it would work was, is that if the technology exists to record a holographic uh, video, sort of, right, with lots of cameras taking a 3D um, video, the idea would be that you would walk around the action. So you would control the camera and you could walk around what is happening as if it was in the room. Yeah, this isn't creeping me out any less. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just, I just wanted to make sure we understood how creepy it could get. So the guy wouldn't be sitting there in the office. He would be walking around the office. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I think that might be even, that might be even worse. So it's the future. It's the future. It is. And it does. It actually reminds me, there was a video I had to watch for one of my psychology courses and it was basically you know as as the field tends to do it was a warning against like social media and gamification and technology oh it's so scary and the i cannot for the life of me i even looked through my notes cannot remember the name of the video but basically it was somebody had a piece of tech like if you could take the hollow lens and like put it in your eyes like a contact lens and it gave the young gentleman stats on the woman that he had showed up to date so it pulled information, but like her heart rate and her perspiration and the, the micro emotions in her face. So whether she was like smiling or not smiling or whether she was digging what he was saying or not, and which was incredibly creepy. And then on top of that, if he could get like her heart rate over a certain number or perspire a certain amount or her eyes to dilate a certain amount, he would actually get like trophies and awards and, and achievements for getting certain things. And that kind of reminds me of this a, a, a little bit, the idea that you could have basically your heads up display telling you about all of those kind of secret things that we keep inside our own heads, which are secret for a reason. Could you, um, do you, you have a, a connect for Xbox One? I do. So you know how there's this mode where you can see that it has infrared and it has heat signature and it has all these different modes? Yes. So the Connect is reading all of this information. Also a Microsoft product, by the way, right? So what makes the HoloLens work, supposedly, uh, that holographic part, is really that it all those sensors, like what you just described means that there has there have to be um, certain sensors on the other person, right, to be able to read certain things about them. And But we have technology now that we don't need to have the other person wear something to see their body temperature change or, or to... Um, read a whole bunch of vitals so th the whole hololens it has all of these sensors and it's actually mapping and reading the entire 360 degree space around you at all times processing that information and kind of putting it all together with all of the hologram stuff that it's creating inside and then feeding it to you in a way that looks believable mm -hmm. 
it is that the in the presentation they mentioned terabytes of information being processed at a time. And if you imagine all of the information, every single nook and cranny, all of that space, every corner, every edge, and things like temperature, uh, that's a lot of information being processed at the same time. Yes. And I think and I think that's why we could never do something like this before, because there was no way to process something like that in a self contained device. Okay. Now, now I do, I do want to bring up a few other examples uh, because to really phone home how, how this works and what it can do. Another thing that they showed for reporters is uh, they worked with NASA and in the concept video, um, they show that the guy's working at his desk and he's looking at footage from uh, the Mars landing. And then he hits a button and all of a sudden his whole office becomes Mars. And then someone else is uh, like uh, a figure that's showing him something in that space. And they, according to reporters, um, what happens is that person who's showing them something points at something and there's like a, like dotted lines that come from the person's eye to the thing that they want the other person to see. And then you can walk around this area, uh, this object in a 3D space and the entire room looks like the surface of Mars but it looked like your office just a few seconds before. And all this is being projected is what you see through the lenses. Mm -hmm. Got it? Sure. We'll go with yes. <laughs> I mean, the, I mean, I the idea of being ahead. able to walk on Mars is, without having to get in a spaceship is, is pretty cool. I mean, everything that they showed is really, really interesting and it's exciting. And there's half of my brain who's like, yeah, it's the future, man. Then there's the other half of my brain of, oh my gosh, what... <laughs> What is this going to do for human interaction? I mean, obviously there are, there are benefits and it's never the technology that's good or bad. It's how we use it. So I definitely want to throw that out there as, as a preface. But, you know, video games, which are, I think we can say, a large step less immersive than this particular piece of technology, are already called to be, you know, time stealers and abducting our children and things like that. And, you know, before video games, it was, it was pinball machines were sucking our children into you know, the depths of hell. And before that, it was the, the radio and the phonograph. And even the printing press was something that was scary because it was a new piece of tech. And I'm just, I guess I'm just waiting for that backlash to come and like trying to brace myself because I you know it's coming because anytime there's something n new technologically that comes out, especially if it has entertainment value, it instantly becomes criticized by the generation just before it. I think I think that's why our conversations can can help kind of offset that in a way because we can see the positive uh, potential in something like this if we get creative enough. Because you're right, absolutely, lots of people go right to the negative, and and I think VR has more potential for people getting I guess lost in it, right, and mm -hmm. misusing because it is all encompassing and. The, all of this holographic stuff that they're presenting is imagine if you could bring some of that outside of the monitor. Like your monitor is no longer the only way to access information. And now we can access it in a 3D space and use the space around you. You know what it kind of reminds me of? <laughs> this is going to be a total geek reference, so bear with me. There is an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation where they had this thing that actually kind of looked like Google Glass a little bit. And it was this game and everybody got like super addicted to it because it like hijacked your brain and Wesley Crusher had to save the day and, you know, to avoid it. And well, actually Data actually ended up saving the day. But so everybody's like just sitting in their chair, staring with this glazed over expression at this particular game. And I can I can kind of see that sort of thing happening in like a home space where everybody, you know, let's say you've got a family of five and everybody, and even the dog has their hoggles on and are experiencing... You mean hollow lenses. I'm calling them hoggles. I am. <laughs> and, you know, I, I can definitely see how that would make people uncomfortable. I can definitely see how that would creep people out. But I also see how, you know, human beings are incredibly adaptable. And, you know, the, the same way that my three-year-old niece can work the iPad better than anybody else because she's never known anything else you know the next generation coming up behind us old geezers will be think that hoggles are a normal thing that that is just the way that the world has always worked and i think that definitely helps 
Because I know I, I definitely feel that tension with, like, when I go home and visit my family, and I'm just on my, my phone either playing Heyday, which is awesome and you should definitely play with me, or if I'm texting and, you know, my parents will make quips like, well, why don't you come back and join us in the real world when you're ready? Or, you know, things like that. And I can already see that happening, and I'm so hyper aware of me not doing it. I was like, I don't, I don't want to be my parents, at least not in that way. I don't want to see a, a child with their hollow lens and go, you should take that off and join us in the real world. See, well, I think, I think that's what the, the most interesting thing about the hollow lens is that it, you're still, like, it's completely clear. So you actually see everything around you. The, the last example that they showed was someone just building something in 3D. And uh, if you've ever modeled anything in 3D, you know, you know you're using a 2D space, uh, you know, I mean a 2D screen, and you are drawing, right? And you're looking at X, Y, Z axes, and you're moving things around, and you're drawing. And then uh, imagine just being able to actually draw it outside of the screen in a 3D space. And that's something that they showed. They showed it looked just like... Um, not just like, but very similar to the Iron Man movies mm -hmm. um, where he is controlling things on the outside and he's creating his suit, right? And he's changing things. So in the demo, they did a live demonstration of this where the girl kind of just uh, put a menu on the right-hand side and it kind of just floated there. And then in the space to the left, she created a 3D object. And even though they didn't pan all the way around it, she could have just gotten under it and walked all the way around it to see exactly what it was going to look like. Mm -hmm. Now, today, a lot of people do that with 3D printers. You do something here on the computer, then you print it out, and then you look at it. So you're like, okay, this is it. Um, in medicine, that's one thing that uh, um, has been being used for years. Like a surgeon can take uh, scans of a patient, um, for example, if it's a back surgery, and they could 3D print the back, uh, the, the, the piece of the spinal cord that they're going to operate on, play with it, look at what they're going to get themselves into, so then when they go in, it's a lot easier and there's no surprises. Mm -hmm. And imagine just being able to walk around that space without having to make that step of physically creating it. But all the while, like let's say I'm creating something in 3D, I'm just drawing, making a game piece or something. And then you walk into the room. I can see you. You're you're right behind the piece. Mm -hmm. If you wanted, you could like walk into it and kind of mess with me because you know it's <laughs> to me it's floating in midair, but to you, I'm just waving my arms around. So it's not it's not as immersive as uh, as VR as virtual reality because they also showed an example of Minecraft, for example. I how many that. how many so kids cool. get? <laughs> and how many kids get lost in Minecraft, right? For just hours and hours. Adults too. Uh, Everyone. Minecraft, Minecraft is awesome. <laughs> yeah. And they showed this example where the, the guy clicked a button and then his whole living room became a Minecraft playset, essentially. His, all his furniture was covered in uh, material. So then he could start um, molding his physical space. And that's different because, like, you're running around, right? It's not like the kid is just stuck. His Your kid could be running around his room playing with HoloLens, but not necessarily just sitting in front of a computer. It's kind of it's kind of different. Yeah, I, I think about the, the Minecraft one, and my thought instantly goes to current measures of intelligence. So basically the the tools that we use to assess intelligence, they all have a, a perceptual reasoning dimension to them. So your ability to rotate three-dimensional objects or even two-dimensional objects to, to either match patterns or to, to recreate things. And all I can think about is, man, if somebody, especially kids, since their brain is so much more plastic, if kids got a hold of this, their PRI scores would, I mean, in theory, go through the roof because you would be using this part of your brain that you normally don't. And I've had a very personal experience with that recently because in my game program, I'm in a 3D modeling class. And I've never really had to do something like this before, where I'm I'm making a three-dimensional object in a two-dimensional space and having to, it literally feels like I'm bending my brain to try and wrap around and see what everything looks like in all the different dimensions. And the first time I tried it, it was so hard. I just, I kind of just booted it up and then turned it off. And then, you know, obviously I've, I've had to do it for class and the, the more I've done it, the better I've gotten at it, which is great because that means I'm not too old to learn. So go me. And, but just like that could be something so accessible that everybody, even a child could pick it up and easily integrate. I mean, that just, it's, it's expanding the human mind. And I, I just wonder what it's going to do for, 
you know, perceptual reasoning tasks or, or STEM fields. Like if you're, you know, eight years old or even 18 years old and you're playing with blocks and you're building something and you're 3D creating things in your own view, how is that going to impact your interests and your ability to score well on tests and your ability to pursue these more scientifically based areas of, of career and tech that we, we so desperately need? So I think this is one thing that I, I just I love about science fiction is that science fiction is this amazing catalyst for current technology. You know, for example, I, I think one of my favorite stories is when they were filming the original Star Trek. I'm a huge Trekkie, if you hadn't guessed. They uh, had people, like, opening and closing the, the doors because they had to do it manually. And there was some cast member saying, I thought that was the most ridiculous thing on the show, that some, that, you know, doors would just automatically open because people wouldn't use doorknobs anymore. And then only a few years later, the automatic sliding doors at, that you see at like grocery stores and, you know, other convenience stores, that it came into existence. I mean, that the iPad is the data pad from, from Star Trek. 3D modeling is the replicator. And it just, it makes me so excited because I think about what I've seen in recent tech movies and think, or not tech movies, but like science fiction movies. And I wonder, well, what's going to come next? Like, I feel like all this Star Trek-y stuff is coming true. What's what's next? The, the door is an interesting example because I think once you walk up to the door and it automatically opens and it starts feeling natural, I think people start accepting it, right? If you had to yes. stand in front of it and do like a disco move and say three <laughs> magic words, no one would want that, right? It's like, no, right. I'd rather use the doorknob. And, and with your example of like the 3D modeling and stuff, um, I think one problem that you're, you're probably having now is that, um, you're looking at something 3D on a 2D screen and you have to, your, your view of it is dependent of a camera essentially, right? Yes. That you're rotating and moving around. And again, we have video game experience, so we know what it's like to like move a camera around, have an inverted look and all this kind of thing and what the sensitivity is. And the more, once you get to the point where that feels natural, everything opens up. And the, the, what the HoloLens would do is, like you said, a kid could be building something and all of a sudden there isn't this weird disconnect between I'm building and now I'm going to use the camera control to change my perspective and see what it looks like. You're just moving your head around. It's completely natural. Mm -hmm. And then you're kind of skipping that step and then you're able to to focus on the actual object and and the space around it. Yeah, I think that speaks so much to why technology, especially entertainment technology, is usually so feared is this idea of intuitiveness that I mean, I can only imagine what people in older generations thought and felt like when you know, the typewriter came along and there were younger people who could do it faster. Or nowadays when, you know, people in our generation can type 60, 70 words per second on a word processor and, you know, do all these things that my parents struggle with. And I, I think that's part of maybe where the, the backlash comes from societally is the idea that somebody either less experienced than you or younger than you or just new to you is able to do something so much better than you can. There's there's definitely a threat element to that. Uh, I mean, in the workplace, it's really easy to see because, you know, we can hire this undergrad who can type 70 words per minute and knows all this tech for, you know, pennies on the dollar, or we have this person who's 50 and we'd have to actually train them and they're at a higher pay grade. You know, what decision is, is the job going to make? Or, you know, for parents, the idea that they're, I know it's terrifying because I know when I've talked to parents, uh, you know, in practice and when I do conversations about this kind of thing with other mental health clinicians, Parents are so afraid because they don't know what it is. You know, my, my child is using Twitter. What is that? And I think a lot of the fear against tech comes from the lack of knowledge, which is in itself a very psychological construct. Um, I remember the first kind of technical engineering job I ever had. I needed to, I had a machine shop and I needed them to uh, create a piece for me that I was going to use in a lab. And I put all my, I was just out of college and I used all my drafting skills to draw this perfect, like from every angle, exactly what I needed, you know, measurements are perfect. And I remember handing it to the technician who was going to create it for me at the machine shop. And he looks at it and then opens up a 3D modeling program and creates the whole thing in about uh, 15 seconds. Mm. For him to even put the the actual measurements in, uh, it was amazing. 
And after that, I never wanted to draw again because <laughs> 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 I felt I felt like how how is this the the end result was exactly the same, and uh, his was actually better, and it was so so fast. And so all of a sudden, I wanted to learn how to do that. And I think it was it was real and it was right in front of me, and it was a game changer. You know, it 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 made it, it just completely blew my mind when when he did that. And I think a lot of this technology has that that ability to do that. I think in the past, especially that huge backlash comes from, again, not being, it doesn't seem viable or even like natural, like that example with the door, but mm-hmm. just, it, it doesn't seem viable. I'm, I read a really interesting article yesterday about how, and I don't want to make this an Apple versus Microsoft thing. Um, but it, they said that whenever Apple does a press conference, they're not showing you far flung future tech. They're mm-hmm. showing you something that you can buy either today or within the next 90 days. And sometimes what they show looks futuristic. Like the first time they showed a capacitive touchscreen, um, people talk about how people gasped in the, at the press conference. And it wasn't a proof of concept. It was Steve Jobs was holding the phone in his hand. Mm-hmm. And it was something that people, they'd never seen, but they, they were able to see it when the conference was over. You know, And, and they, could, they, they could buy it very soon after yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that huge gap um, where like the, the rate of adoption makes such a big difference. And now it's so different, right? Uh, printing press uh, is, a, is a great example that always comes up when people talk about, you know, people being afraid of technology. How long did it take to create, um, you know, set up the printing uh, press to print that one book? And then the one book was printed. And how long did it take for a lot of people to have a book in their hands? And that... Um, that rate of adoption, I think, is what makes the the, the backlash uh, time frame kind of change. Because once people can start doing it, if Microsoft starts touring the country and at every mall and at every school they're showing off HoloLens, then they're they're doing a great PR work. But they're they're convincing people immediately, and we don't have to use our imagination to uh, kind of uh, only think about the the bad stuff. Like we can actually show us positive examples and concrete examples, like real examples. Yeah, the accessibility, it, just, it can't yes. be understated. And you, you saw Microsoft do that uh, during their, their press conference was, uh, for example, Windows 10 is free. If you've, if you've got a Windows tablet or a certain number, I don't remember which operating system since I'm a, a Mac person, but I mean, that's brilliant. Like if you want to get your tech into people's hands, give it to them for free or significantly discounted. Uh, another great example is the Unity engine that I use in my game development class. That piece of tech is amazing and it's free, which is why almost everybody uses it and why it usurped uh, Unreal as like one of the best pieces of hardware for or software for game devs. I mean, the price is, I mean, it's huge because Unreal was unrealistic, too expensive for indies. And I mean, that's the thing is if something is free, people are going to People like free. There's a very psychological concept behind wanting free stuff or having something that's really expensive. So a high value target item set at like a super cheap price, which is why people go absolutely nuts on Black Friday. Because there's this idea of scarcity and I have to have it now. And it's a really, it's this huge discount. So I can get this really high value item for less resources. And it really kind of just kicks into our, our limbic system and we must have it. Well, the psychology of free and the the value that people put on things is really, really interesting. It is. And lots of times uh, it's the most expensive thing that, that is most valuable to people, right? Yes. They'd rather pay money for something that costs a lot of money or, or more money than the cheap thing. There's all this perception to it. But I think that the, the thing with technology, like software in particular and things like that, is the, is the fact that communities are built around them. The fact that if you don't know how to use Unity, you don't have to call necessarily uh you know 1-800-UNITY to get <laughs> I went you know, on YouTube get... I can tell you yeah that. <laughs> exactly exactly and there's forums and there's this whole community of people who are helping each other out and making it better I, I think uh, well I guess I'm, I'm hung up on the psych of of cost if something is high in value and it's perceived to be high in value then people will pay for it that's why Chanel and Dolce and Gabbana and all those like super signature like oh you see somebody wearing you know, a, a Dolce and Gabbana sunglasses that gives them status. But the thing with technology, especially like this uh, Hololens, price-wise, it's expensive. But there's no proof that it's going to be of value to me. 
And I think that's where discounting the price comes in handy because you're talking about lowering the bar to gaining an experience that people might be trepidatious about. It's kind of like when you go out and you buy paint. You might want to get the same paint color you know because you know what it is and you know you like it and you know you're getting your money's worth. But if the company was like, hey, here's a free pint of paint. Why don't you try out this new color? And they either give it to you for free or at a discounted price. The barrier to trying something new is diminished. And again, that's a very basic human thing. We like what we know. We tend to fear what we don't understand. So if you can combat that fear by making the whatever it might be very accessible, because again, nothing decreases fear faster than exposure. So if people are afraid of X and you can get them to use X of their own volition and lower the difficulty of getting X, then they're going to get exposed to X and it's going to become less scary. Exposure. We need to talk about exposure. Cause the I good think kind. A, the therapeutic yes. kind. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> I think that that's one of the one of the big areas where 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 there's like beneficial potential. Oh, I'm so excited. These type of technologies. Um, I, go ahead. Oh, I, I, one of the very first things I thought about when I saw the hoggles were, oh my gosh, I want that in therapy. I want that so bad. I mean, biofeedback already exists. So tech that you can hook up to yourself and it tells you, you know, your your heart rate and your gal, galvanic skin response with this sweating in your palms, things like that. And I mean, with all the wearables nowadays, you know, people are keeping track of their, their bio stats. But the idea that you could have somebody in therapy and have them put on the HoloLens and it would track for them, hey, look, your your anger is escalating or your anxiety is escalating or, you know, your depressive symptoms, your withdrawal, your, your neuronal activity is decreasing. And so they get like these heads ups where they can become more aware of what their body is doing, because that's something that we do so much in therapy already is getting people aware of what they're experiencing so that they can have more control over how they experience something. And that, that that was the very first thing. Like, I want that in therapy because that would be awesome. Yeah, and that's that's where I see the the greatest potential too is in the immediate feedback, right? Because even with a biofeedback machine and all these other things, like sometimes you still need somebody to interpret it, and it's not as clear. But mm -hmm. if you have that thing on and it is actually showing you and explaining you in such a way, which is something that I think that I think you and I will 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 probably talk a lot about in the future it just like hololens is a long way off but um, just using interactive uh mediums to be able to show this information in a particular way that like how would you show kids this and how would you make it really easy for seniors to understand mm -hmm. and how could you make it so that um again the the more immediate the feedback the the more immediate the the learning Right. So they're immediately like, OK, what a minute, this happened. And then you could see, again, there's a million different ways to do it. Right. But like you just said, OK, look, your heart rate just increased to here when this happened. And they could see a graph and they could see it over time on the screen. Or like an um, angry face. Just have like a, an, a have a little happy face on the side of your screen. And when you're calm, the face is like yellow and it's happy. And then as you steadily get angrier, the color changes. You take something that is easily recognizable, something you're already familiar with. You know, most people realize that red or a frowny face is a bad thing. So if that's in your heads up display, you can gradually see yourself going towards a breaking point. And it's just a really familiar way. And like you said, that immediate feedback is just, it's invaluable. But the potential of HoloLens is that it could actually make your skin change color. Like, oh, wait a minute, you're getting mad, right? Ooh, you know? I like because, that. Yeah, because it's projecting something on reality. Right. Like we're we're see, because this is this is the most exciting part, the the idea of what can we do with this? Because we could already have a kind of a heads up display. We just have a screen on the side. Like I like mm -hmm. I have a, a screen in my in my office for for exactly this type of thing. But imagine if the person is just has something on. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's all this. Uh, very specific locations on the body that could light up or different areas. I mean, just the, again, the possibilities are endless. They can look down at themselves like, oh, am I really like my temperature is going up? I didn't realize that. And, and yeah. we can change their skin color or, or just have one place like their heart. We could have a visual heart. Let's say when we look down at their chest, they can see something that resembles a heart mm -hmm. and we could show it actually beating at the rate that it's actually beating. That's and you so could cool. see that. And it could radiate some sort of not only a sound, but some sort of visual cue. And the faster it goes, maybe the bigger it gets, you know, whatever could reinforce that, that understanding and that awareness of what is happening at that moment. Science. Science. <laughs> so cool. It's, it's so exciting. And so with something like this and you know, with the Oculus Rift, which I think most people know about. And again, just the 
that we've had these kind of augmented realities that are, we're changing our perception of the world around us, that we're able to to see things that aren't really there. So on one hand, I'm like, ooh, we're like simulating what it's like to have hallucinations. How cool is that? And again, just the, I read an article the other day about how using your smartphone changes the brain. Like the, the area that, of the brain that specifically controls your thumb, I think in most people has been expanding. Like they've been taking MRIs and fMRIs and basically the area of the brain that controls that particular motor function has been like being bolstered just because people use their smartphones so much. And then when they pick up their smartphone, that part of their brain just lights up. And that is so cool because our tech is, I mean, it can't not change our brain. But the fact that we understand the brain now so much better and we can actually see it impacting, I mean, it makes me really excited for things like um, preventing Alzheimer's or other kind of uh, degenerative brain diseases. Because if you're actively using different parts of your brain, you know, whether it's the, the sound center, whether it's the visual cortex, whether it's the ability to rotate 3D objects in your mind and, and manipulate them in space, those are all things that have been shown to help either stem the the development of a particular disease or to actually just kind of not let it happen. And that's that to me is really, really cool uh, as well. You mentioned the like the idea of, of hallucinations. Yeah. And and I wanted to to touch on the 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 idea. I think I, this is the first thing I started talking about that idea of perception, mm-hmm. right? Because the Hololens, I think, an advantage that it has over. So so we're talking about augmented reality, right? You still see the world around you, and there's something on top of it, like that idea of seeing your skin change color um, through the Hololens. That's an augmentation of your reality, and. But virtual reality does this thing where it uh, completely encapsulates you and puts you somewhere completely different, and and all of the, the 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 brain science of this is is so so cool because I, whether you talk to some philosophers or a lot of scientists, right? The idea of what your reality is is just the uh, collection of all the information that it's gathering, right? Mm-hmm. So, for example, somebody who has uh, auditory hallucinations, for example, um, they're hearing it. They're really hearing it. Like, it's part of their reality that there's actually a sound there. And if they have visual hallucinations, to them it's real, right? To us it's not. Um, but to them it's real. Yeah, you see the parts of the brain light up. For example, someone having auditory hallucinations, they the part of the brain that would normally light up when say, myself hears something, it lights up in that part of the brain for the person hallucinating when they hear that hallucination. And it's the same thing for sight, the part of the visual cortex and the occipital lobe, it lights up. So the idea that perception is reality mm-hmm. is so true. So so imagine um, that the big difference here is that virtual reality completely... So, so we talked about this. You've, I've used Oculus. You've never used Oculus Rift. I Correct. haven't because the line has always been too long. Yes, so I've I've uh, I've used it a few times because uh, I, I I had to do whatever I needed to do to to try uh, virtual reality. And and this is something that if you're really interested in in trying this out, um, and you're listening to us, uh, and you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, go to like a local university or something, or or even uh, small conventions. Like uh, the Oculus Rift developer kit is is always around three hundred dollars, so it's actually everywhere. It's one of those things that's really really interesting. It's not a commercial grade, but so many developers have it, and so many people just tinkering have it. And anyway, so so it's out there, right? There's different experiments. The thing is that even in, in its earliest incarnations, when you put it on, it's like you feel like you have this thing on your head, and it's big and bulky, and the resolution isn't good, so it's like watching like standard definition television. It used to be the the new ones are much better, and so just imagine something like Minecraft, just very blocky, something very old, maybe blurry. But that doesn't matter because <laughs> the, your head movement is the camera in the game, mm-hmm. and everything that you see around you is this virtual space. So your brain, all of a sudden, doesn't have the information of where it really is. The visual information is from what it's seeing. The audio information isn't from where it really is. It's from what it's hearing from the simulation. So it's so hard to explain. But whatever you're looking at, it's you think you're there, even though it doesn't even look real. Because that's just the information that you have. Um, I did one simulation where it was I started on a second floor and there was a balcony. 
And then I went and I walked up to the balcony and I was really afraid to get close to it. And then I kind of like bent over the balcony to see down and then I could see the first floor. Um, and then <laughs> I reached out to hold myself on the balcony and there was no balcony there. <laughs> and I almost <laughs> fell. And your mind just, it's so it's so confusing, <laughs> but it's so interesting. Uh, again, it's just perception is reality. All of this stuff is going to change so many things in the future. And we're definitely going to see virtual reality before um, this holographic stuff, uh, especially with like Facebook backing Oculus Rift. Mm -hmm. It's going to be in a lot of places and a lot of people will experience it. And augmented reality is so much harder because we already have these virtual worlds. Like we have... Um, like a movie, like a Pixar movie, right? It's completely 3D. You could actually, if they wanted, they could release a version of it where you could kind of move the camera inside and pause it because those spaces are real. In video games, we're used to moving inside these fully realized virtual worlds. So all that virtual reality is doing is putting the, the, the camera on our head and then letting us control it differently. There's this weird thing where um, in virtual reality, for it to be believable, there has to be this, uh, the way the camera moves has to be, even where it's positioned, it has to feel like it's uh, at a person's height. And the way it moves when you walk has to resemble how you move when you walk so that you'll believe it. And all this stuff is integrated so that it feels more immersive. So it does feel like you're really there, regardless of that it looks like garbage, maybe. It is, uh, it is incredible. Um, and I just, I just wanted to make that really clear that, that that is one thing. And then, the holograms and the augmented reality, it's a combination of the two. It's introducing those those uh, foreign elements into your actual reality. And that's why the technology is coming, is going to come much later. And and there's so much that can be done there because then we're, we're really mixing the two. When we talk about virtual reality, we're just talking about navigating a virtual world. And augmented reality is combining the two. I just really want a holodeck. Uh, those are really far, far off. I to, know, to but that's what I want. Much farther off. I want to just load up a program of something and then just jump in there and be a part of it. And yeah, that would be awesome. So that's the next step. That's where yeah. where, where, where things are like force fields are manipulated is to it, make solid it, matter. Is it the next generation? Oh. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go down this uh, that was good. whole of Come Star on. Trek puns with you. That nope. was nope. so good. Nope. nope. Hey, resistance is it. futile, my friend. Oh. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. You are such a Trekkie. Yeah. Ollie and I, I need to get together. I didn't know this. Yeah. <laughs> we, we would jam. <laughs> All right. So is there anything else that uh, we should touch on, on kind of uh, – both of these things, I think, I think they go hand in hand. And I, again, I think augmented reality is really cool. I think that um, Microsoft did uh, a great job in sci-fiing it up for that press conference because I don't think that that's going to happen for a really, really long time. Um, but it's great to kind of just put that out there and get us thinking about it, have these, these conversations going because I think there is a lot of potential there and people probably don't don't really know what to do with it yet. Yeah, I and mean, that's kind of the big thing is I can think about stuff that I would want to do with it professionally because that it's very conducive to what I do professionally. I think it's really exciting. But again, like you mentioned, it is pretty far off. And I think that's another place that the psychology of things comes into play is we tend to not get super stoked about things that are so far in the future because we're all about that immediate gratification. And I think that's another reason why Apple does what they do is – you know, they can get the hype train going for, you know, Google Glass, and then it's available. Whereas this, it's hard to get the hype train going. Like, it's exciting in concept, but I'm not saving my pennies to go buy one because it is so far, far off. And, you know, first generation things tend to be pretty buggy. And so, yeah, it's it's exciting. Like, conceptually and theoretically, I'm very excited, but I don't see it being on my Christmas list for a while. Yeah, my guess is that Google Glass is not out right now because it it doesn't achieve that level of um, just I don't, I don't know what this is called, right? But that that idea of actually it's it I think I think it has to do with perception too. The idea that if it doesn't work all the time, it feels like it doesn't work, 
And Perf- yes. Yes, right. a million times yes. Right. So like if they release what they have now, that thing is not gonna work. So so for example, I'll use another Microsoft technology, which is the the Connect. Um the Connect is designed for a broad um spectrum of voices and accents and rooms and lighting, but it doesn't work for everybody. And it doesn't work every time, and it's very frustrating. That yeah. first time that you have to tell it, you have to say Xbox on four times for it to turn on. <laughs> You're like that's it. Like I could have, I could have pressed the on button a I long time ago. I could have gotten off my butt and walked all the way across the room to push the button, uh, or picked Cor- up the controller. <laughs> Cortana, okay, Google, Siri, they don't understand you every time. They think you said pepperoni when you said New York City. I don't know, right? Like it's yeah. it's it's one of those things where if it doesn't work all the time. That it does, it feels like it doesn't work. And, and that's yeah, that's part yeah. of that that accessibility and that that ease of integration is, yeah. Siri and I, we fight, we fight <laughs> a lot. I'm like, call Josue, calling Domino's. No, you stupid. Yep. I'm yep. sorry, I can't help you right now. Yeah. And it's I like I could have just dialed the number myself. So so screw you. And but I really do like my automatic doors because they do always open and then close behind me. So. And <laughs> when they don't, you walk into them <laughs> yeah. because, because they're at a point where they all, right. We expect them to always work and when they don't, it's jarring, yeah, right? It's, it's like, like you may even get mad. It. Yeah. 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 It's like, whoa, exactly. Like, what was this disruption? Like, wait, wait a minute. I waited an extra second, a whole second in front of that door before it opened. Or, or even the internet. Why I'm oh. loading this page. It only has 5,000 images. Why is it taking more than a second to load this page? Yeah. Whereas, yeah. you know, when I first started on the internets back in the day, you know, I waited for the, you know, it sounds like a cat dying while I log on. And, you know, that, that was, was pretty it. good. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's that how quickly can I integrate it into my life, especially now since we're so busy. Like, I don't I don't have time to wait two seconds for my little cats. I need it now. Yeah, it's like a word processing, like you said. It would have never replaced a typewriter if, unless every keystroke is translated into a command, right? And that that level of how often it works and how easily it works and how natural it feels is what a lot of these technologies um, have to. That's the risk. They can't release until it actually works. And if it doesn't, then you have things like. Microsoft removing the Connect from the Xbox One or the or Google Glass suddenly, you know, going back for for you know some recalibrating or whatever it is that they're doing with it, because at least th- the technologies that are there, they're going to keep evolving and they're going to get better. Mm-hmm. But these iterations cannot just uh, sort of work kind of some of the time because then it the perception is that it 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 doesn't work. Or even one thing that I find absolutely fascinating is even if the technology works, like technically speaking, it is it is working, the fact that it doesn't have human mannerisms or, or human qualities can sometimes be very upsetting or, or frustrating. And there was a, an article, I can't remember, a while ago I read where they were measuring how irritated people got with uh, things like Siri or Cortana. Not because they didn't listen, because they did. They would do, take the directions. They did very well. But because they would interrupt people. Like if, if you've ever used GPS and you're driving down the road and you're talking with somebody and all of a sudden Siri goes, turn left at the exit. You realize that the conversation that you were having with that person stopped. And it's it's a small thing, but it it annoys people because it feels like Siri is not respecting the the social cues of humanity, which is the same reason we get upset or irritated or can when people interrupt us in in like real conversations. The same thing is being applied to devices like Siri. So another just a huge dimension of it is not just getting it to work in the technical aspect, but how do we get it to work so that it doesn't annoy or irritate? How do we get the technology to observe human norms without it becoming Skynet? So, so I didn't, I never even thought of this, but I'm I'm absolutely certain that my connect would still be on if it apologized to me every time it made a mistake and told me that it would do better next time, or at least would try. Or at, I didn't at even least, think of that. Yeah, at least responded to you in some way because Xbox on and then it just sits there and I'm like, really, really. Well, but I mean, like when Siri says something wrong, right? It's like Siri, that was wrong. 
You know, if Siri okay, were like I'll apologetic, try. like, oh, I'm really sorry. What did you really mean? I will do my best. And then you know that there's an algorithm that's like trying to get better. Like, I, yeah, I never thought of that, but I think it would absolutely make it more, people would be more forgiving. Yeah. Because I'm not, because it, it is just, uh, um, it is just a piece of, uh, like, it is just a machine and I don't, now I'm mad at you. So I'm going to disconnect you because I can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because it's, it's the idea that even no matter how much tech we get and how sophisticated and complicated our technology is, we are still flawed bags of flesh with a, a cabbage sized gooey thing between our ears. Like that is, we are organic things and we make mistakes. And, you know, I mean, can you imagine if you were in a self-driving car and it took a wrong turn? Like how angry <laughs> you would get at, at that car? And it just, so yeah, part of it is, is trying to get the technology not just to work, but to work well with humans. Because again, even something as, as normal as a word processor, like when I'm sitting down on my Mac and it starts to pinwheel, I get frustrated because I'm trying to work and you are stopping me from working. And if we want to kick it back even further, do you remember like when we were little and you had those pencils that had the pieces of lead and then you would pull out a little plastic thing and then you would shove it through the top of the pencil and the new lead would come out? Yes. I would get annoyed when those went dull. So, I mean, it's this idea of there's something impeding me from what I want to do. Something is de delaying my gratification of accomplishing something. And so I'm going to rage at it. And I think that's just something that's probably always been there. And I guess unless I get on some more Valium or something, you know, or that that comes with the hoggles is like just this this drip of like serotonin and dopamine to keep you chill. Then, yeah, technology has a, has a way to go uh, before it can act human or at least kind of interact with human in a social way. But then again, I'm not sure I want that because I don't want the singularity to happen. And Terminator was a great movie. I just don't want to live it. So there is, uh, and I'm not going to get deep into this, into the idea of like just reverse engineering the algorithms that, that we use to do things, right? To process information and kind of taking those and then integrating them into our technology so that it can learn and adapt and, and, and do things uh, so that it, it works. I mean, there's all this, like, if you talk about Wi-Fi signals and, and, and just any kind of signal transmission, and there's this idea of error correction, and you're always trying to correct all these millions of variables that could go wrong. Um, and that's, that's really important. And I think, you know, in that, like, I don't like the idea of like making it, uh, adding humanity to, uh, to uh, an, a machine necessarily, right? But what you're saying is absolutely right. Like, how, how can we make that interaction more less less annoying less offensive maybe <laughs> and what's what's right? really interesting about that question is it brings up the idea of free will if we can just re-engine backwards engineer how we act and how we think and how we feel and put it into a computer program and it can do it just as well as we can do we really have agency are, are we actually in control of our own bodies and thoughts and behaviors or are we just a series of circuits that are firing and there's I mean, there's tons of research out there that you know for example you've already had a thought or you've already made up your decision subconsciously and at the neuronal level before you actually become aware of that decision and so this idea of agency and of free will is do we have it and i guess especially if you can program a computer to seamlessly do the same which we haven't so i'm still on the free will bandwagon yeah, and I mean, in in the work that we do, a big part of it, you could look at it as kind of reprogramming some of our our inefficient programming, right? So that we're so that we function a little better. And sometimes that's like identifying, okay, this is a variable. It's I, I actually, and uh, I don't talk about this a lot, but that's the way I've always looked at uh, the this uh, cognitive behavioral therapy work that I do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking for variables, and I'm replacing them to uh, achieve a better outcome. I think that's that's the engineer in me. Um, that's the way I view it. And and yeah, if, when you put it that way, <laughs> the way you're presenting all this, um, that's a whole other conversation for well, a you, whole other day. It's really interesting. I don't know. We're, we're running out of time, but I do want to slip in there real quick that uh, Josue sent me a article about Mario becoming somewhat self-aware. And they uh, some programmers gave Mario artificial intelligence and like he would approach a Goomba and say, I don't know what to do with this. And then they would have him jump on the Goomba. And then when he approached the next Goomba, he said, 
this is a thing, and if I jump on it, maybe it will maybe it will go away. And so it, he was learning and processing, and I mean, obviously still a far cry from being able to have real emotions and things, but machines are learning. And... Yeah, did you, if you, did you see the, the, well, I'm sure you did, right? They had these uh, decision trees that were so huge, right? To just mm-hmm. take up all these variables and it would do everything from they equated coins to food. So if he, and they had a hunger uh, algorithm running. So if he felt hungry, he knew he needed to get some coins, but even to just respond to you, there were all these decision trees to even improve his grammar, which mm-hmm. is just so impressive. Again, and that's, it's taking the the understanding of how we process things and applying that um, to a computer. It's yeah. fascinating. It's, yeah. it's simultaneously interesting and terrifying, but terrifying in a good way. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. It doesn't, it doesn't scare me too much because um, I think that there's still so much that we don't understand about us. That's the part that terrifies me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're going to make something that thinks like us, but we know more about our galaxy than we do about the human brain. So let's just start tinkering with things that we don't really understand because that never ends badly in the movies. I'm pretty sure I know more about uh, Windows holographic than I know about the human brain. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this right. is good. Yeah, this, this is, is good. This is, oh, yeah. I'm all excited yeah. now. That's what happens after these podcasts. Is I get super, super stoked to go out and like, change the world or something yeah and we and we had to talk about this i think because even even if next you know a week later people aren't talking about it anymore the fact that they've gotten this far along in kind of in secret is is really interesting and now probably other companies will start coming up and saying oh yeah well we've been working on this too and we've been doing this and we've been doing that just like we're seeing with virtual reality yeah very exciting and, you know, again, even though this podcast will probably come out maybe two or three weeks after the event actually happened, since we're recording in the past, uh, technically <gasps> speaking, time travel, dude. The yep. thing is, it's, is that these events, these technological events are not in a vacuum. Like, it's not like you just introduce this new piece of tech and then it is just going to sit there on a shelf. There is this dynamic aspect to how we interact with it. How does other technology interact with it? How can it be used for good? How can it be used for bad? How do we how do we regulate something like that? Is that protected as a like a video game under free speech, or is it more of an action where which can be more strictly uh, moderated or or controlled? And so yeah, it, it never occurs in a vacuum. So just because the event happened, it doesn't mean that it stops to exist after it happened. And and one of the effects that it has is uh, like on me any new technology, it just it makes my old technology seem worse, right? Like I can't forget yeah. about the new one. And like that conversation we just had about uh, uh, a new type of neuro and biofeedback within therapy. Um, I know about all of these different things that already exist and people are using and are experimenting with, and it makes me sometimes feel like I don't want to do what I'm doing now. I want to do that. That's like generations ahead. And it all it also makes me this actually bothers me that so much of the world is always like farther behind, you know, Um, in education right now. I think I mentioned last time, that's one of those things that I'm really, really learning a lot about. And there's so many interesting and cool tools that are applying research that we've known forever. But our schools don't use that. And in mental health, there's all these new cool um, tools that we can use. And people are still doing really, really old stuff. How so, does that make you feel? Oh. <laughs> Why don't you tell me about your mother? Yeah. yeah. HoloLens time or Hoggles. <laughs> I hope Hoggles does not catch on at all. Ever. I'm still using it. I'm, I'm going to stick to my guns here. Hoggles. I'm never. This is the last time I'm ever going to say Hoggles. All right? All right. <laughs> this is good. So uh, we'll be back next week. We will. All right. With a, a new shiny new episode filled with new interesting things to to work the squishy parts between your ears. And where can people find other episodes? The internet. <laughs> so if you want to find some more episodes, you should definitely check out psychtechpodcast.com. That is the mothership. That is our homepage. All of the uh, podcasts will be there as well as some information about uh, Josue and myself so you can get to know us a little bit better. You can also, also contact us there. We have a, a contact form. So if you have feedback, ideas, suggestions, you think we suck, uh, if you think that, then just don't talk to us. If you think we're awesome, please uh, send information our way. You can also contact us on Twitter at psychtechcast and we will respond to you on there. We also have a Facebook page 
and an RSS feed, which was almost the death of me. But it, we did it, and it's there. And yeah, so we're we're super excited to uh, to keep it rolling. And uh, I want catchphrases that have nothing to do with Star Trek. So if anybody has a recommendation, that would be great too. What do you mean catchphrases that have nothing to do with Star Star Trek? Mm -hmm. Yep. No, our own catchphrases, like something we can say, like when we're when we when we end like a podcast. Like I don't just want to say like see you next time. Like I want something psych techy nerdy. You will be assimilated. No. Ah, oh, see. All right. Let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs>